So do you ever go back and look at like your really old tweets just to kind of get an idea of like who you were way back when? And like no, I, no, I was I looking. No, I probably shouldn't, but I occasionally do. I actually was thinking about this the other day, so I, I went down and looked. And 2012 Twitter Mason was weird. Uh, very first tweet ever. September 5th, 2012. We had a school day because we got to school and then the water main broke and they sent us home because there was no like clean water for us to actually drink out of the fountains or to cook in the cafeteria or whatever. So they just sent us home. So on the way out, I tweeted no water or school hashtag excited and thirsty. <laughs> Two weeks later, the Rams were playing uh, the Washington uh, team currently known as the Commanders. Um, we beat RG3 in his rookie season, and I decided to tweet, Hey, RG3, better ice that ego. Hashtag Rams. Uh, there, just, uh, there's some really odd stuff in here. Like 2014, bomb my audition for Mike Wazowski in Monsters, Inc. 3. There's a much funnier story to that, but it's it's like it, the point is like going back and looking at it, you just see how weird or how wrong you are at some of this stuff. It's it's wild. Welcome back to Getaway Day. As always, I am Mason. He is Gautham, and we are here to talk about current, not so current baseball anymore. It's okay. So it's like it's modern, but I wouldn't say it's current. Like basically, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna go back and look at 2022, 2023's free agency. Throughout the really, really weird, um, uh, lo wait, was that the lockout? It was the year after. It was the year after the lockout. Wow. We've been doing this too long. I don't even remember these things anymore. Um, so we're going to go back and look at the 2022-23 free agency. Gautham listened to like all the episodes that we did about it and have, knows what we said. I'm going to talk about what I think we said he's going to tell me what we actually said, and we're going to see what we got right and what we got wrong. But before we get into that, there's a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, you may have noticed if you clicked on this video or uh, audio version of this episode, it's significantly shorter than what we usually do. That is intentional. And what we are basically doing is we are taking our one episode and we're breaking it up into two and posting it at two different times during the week. So if you're listening to this episode, we've actually already released this week in baseball from this same live recording session on Twitch. Um, so we'll always make sure to get this week in baseball out as current as it co possibly can be. And then we'll have our main topic of the week. Two different episodes, a lot easier for you to listen to in a digestible period. So, Gautham, what are your thoughts about that, about life, about whatever you want? What are you thinking? Um, yeah, I am excited to take a trip down memory lane. I mean, it's not like that far down the lane, but at least we'll see where we were a year ago and see where we are today. And, and sometimes, in some cases, it's going to be a wide gap. In some cases, we were spot on. So we got to give ourselves some credit for, for getting some stuff right, too. Yeah, and you, you say it's not that far back. That depends on your mental stride. My mental stride is like I'm shuffling my feet. It's going to take a while all. for me to get there. It feels like a long time. Um, Fair enough, yeah, yeah. All right, so I think the easiest way to do this is just go basically interesting player by interesting player and just start talking. So I think one of the bigger guys of last year's free agency, last year's free agent uh, shortstop market, like 
prior to 23 was bonkers. There were four really, really, really good shortstops that were on the market. Um, and the guy who I think was probably expected to be the top of that market and was the top of that market was Trey Turner. Um, he signed with the Philadelphia Phillies for 11 years, $300 million. Uh, without looking at what we said last year, I could tell you what happened this year. It started out feeling like this was going to be a major bust of a contract. He had a really, really weird season. Uh, the beginning of the season, he was just, I don't want to say abysmal, but compared to his recent performance, that's exactly what it was, was abysmal. And, yeah, uh, it was definitely some of the worst uh, Trey Turner that we've seen. And, you know, we've seen other big free agents struggle in their first year, but this seemed totally, like, out of pocket. It didn't really make sense. Why is a guy that's uh, 29 years old struggling so much? He wasn't, you know, hitting for average like he had basically every other year of his career. Um, not a whole lot of power, too, in the first half. And then something clicked for him. No, and he finished. something didn't click. He was given a standing ovation by the fans of Philly. Something Philly, Philly fans do not do when players are struggling. Philly fans boo. These guys got up and clapped for this man a lot and loudly. Showed that they yeah, were behind I mean, him. To be fair, he kind of started figuring out before the ovation, but we're just going to let Philly fans believe that they did it with the magic of kindness because I want them to quit turning over cop cars when they win stuff. Yeah, it's more fun when there's like one specific moment that you can point to that clearly changes everything, right? Yeah. Then a gradual change. Um, but after that change, whatever it was, he started hitting. Um, and he started hitting for power as well. And he finished extremely strong. Um, it, so it's like, what, who is the real Trey Turner? It was was the first half of blip or was that a sign of, of trouble to come? That's like the big question going to the next season. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely not nearly as bad as his first half last year. And no. and it's kind of weird when you look at his, uh, his numbers throughout the last year as well, because he actually did have a fairly solid June in the middle of a March, April, May, July that were just dreadful um but his june he had three home runs hit 280 like um he was getting on base he was stealing bags and then he went back to struggling really really hard and then all of a sudden august september he's hitting 300 333 he hit 16 home runs in august september in the first three days of october like the dude was on a monster tear and unfortunately that's also not the true trey turner like it's somewhere in between it has to be because this is like the worst we've ever seen him and the best we've ever seen him all in the course of one season so then maybe you can almost look at the full season line and say that's closer to what it's going to look like going forward <laughs> and what we saw like at a macro level like overall 108 wrc plus so good player above average player but not the superstar guy that he had been like the three years prior or even further back really where he's like more than 20 percent better than than the league average which is more like in that superstar category so it's and, concerning right we got 10 more years of this deal yeah yes and no i actually would be willing to give him the benefit of the doubt that at least for the next year or two he'll be a little bit better than his season line from last year. Cause that, that first four months really, really, really pulled it down. Like he got his season numbers back to respectable 26 home runs, 266 average, 322 OBP, 108 WRC plus and almost four war. That's a respectable line. It's also still feels like it's maybe a little bit anchored. Like I think his true line last year and what he probably should have been is like a 275 like a 115 wrc plus that's the guy that i see him being right now like he's still close close ish to that superstar level but on his way back towards being um 
just an all star. Yeah. But, so, no, I mean, that's the other part. Like, I, I may have been a little heavy handed there, but it's still a 3.8, almost four war season. Yeah. And if you can stack several of those together, then you already make the contract kind of worth worth the cost. Like, so. Yeah. I mean, it's, he's, fine. it's, it's a fine. $300 million deal. They're saying that a war right now, or a couple of years ago, a war was worth $8 million. So let's say he does. In the course of his contract, 11 years, this was four war. Let's say he gets three more four war seasons as 12, not 12, as 16, um, maybe a couple two war seasons. So it, let's say he gets 25 war in the course of that. What's 24 or 25 times eight? That'd be 200 million. Let's make it 10. Yeah. I mean, give him 10, 10 million per war for easy math. Right, and $250 million. So yeah, he's yeah, pretty much pretty made close. up the value of the contract. So. Yeah. And then when you count in inflation, it kind of makes sense too. So, so what did we actually say last year? We said we think he's a top ten player in the league, taking an AAV discount because um, it is spread out over eleven years. We kind of compared it to the Bryce Harper deal in terms of getting additional years to balance that luxury tax hit to the team, and um, I think we were all in favor of the deal and. I think that mostly holds up today, right? Like we're still fine with this deal. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm still fine with this deal. In fact, yeah. I'm curious where he actually finished up in the war leaderboard because we said top. I'm sure 10. he was like a top fifty player. Uh, he was tied for forty second. So yeah, okay. top fifty player, not top ten, but. Still a very, very good player at the end of the season. Um, was it second team all MLB or something? Or was oh, that something was else? I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, I would, I'd have wouldn't to look. think that he would get that, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, like like we're saying, I think there's a lot of bounce back potential for Trey Turner with the full season where he doesn't have like four terrible months. He's going to be better than he was last year. Yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to be good with four terrible months. And he, he was top 50. So yeah, that that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but there were some other shortstops on the market last year that maybe were maybe let's let's just move on to the next one. Xander Bogart's got the next biggest deal, uh, two hundred eighty million dollars, eleven years. So very very similar to Trey, and in, in as far as like the size of the contract, twenty million less, but that's not really that much over the scheme of 11 years um so this he went to the san diego padres a team that at the time had juan soto fernando tatis jr who was coming back from breaking his wrist and stuff um manny machado and yeah i guess it was those three and then xander bogarts so four guys that are mega stars essentially in MLB at the time. And what did Xander Bogarts go out and do this year? Do you know? He he roughly did Xander Bogarts things. So he went 285, 350, 440, 20 percent better than league average by WRC plus. Um he actually stole 19 bases. He hit 19 home runs. I mean, it looked generally like a Xander Bogart season. And it was also kind of a strange shape of season. Because his first half was really, really bad, and I think people were talking about that a lot during during the early parts of the season when the Padres were kind of uh, struggling, kind of sledding downhill, and then quietly in like the last month of the season, he hit a whole bunch of home runs, stole a whole bunch of bases, and they brought his uh, season long numbers kind of back in line with what he's done for like year after year after year. Like he's a very consistent player. And if you just look at it from full season long, it, it looks it looks good. You know, it looks fine. Yeah, I didn't realize he had four home runs, six steals and a 417 average in September and October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, you take uh, those away. It's it looks a considerably worse, I would say. Yeah, he he had the Trey Turner season, but worth 20 million dollars less. <laughs> Get it? 
Um, no, but I mean, it was a very similar season to, to um, Trey's, if, if you look at it that way. I mean, it wasn't quite as bad at the beginning, and the hot streak at the end wasn't quite as long. But ultimately, it's kind of disappointing getting adjusted to the city. It just you're going to notice a lot with a lot of the guys we're going to talk about today. Slow starts is a pretty common thing, at least from last year's free agent class. It's not just these two. Um, but yeah, I mean, you start to turn around there at the end of the year. The team was out of it in his case, unfortunately, but I mean, it is what it is. He, he started to show the guy that he used to be and could be and is and that they expect for the next 10 years. So, yeah, I, I guess personally, I'm more concerned about this one. And I think that actually is similar to what I said a year ago. We were shocked by this signing, just the length of years, the amount of money. We weren't expecting this. Uh, we also talked a little bit about his positional fit, which wasn't a huge factor. Um, talked about it being a good problem to have. Um, yeah, Basically, especially now that Tatis has become a gold glove right fielder. Yeah, yeah. So I I just feel like uh maybe another year from now we might not be feeling so good about Xander Bogarts because I really think that one month is is doing a lot here. It's booing him and his numbers to make it seem like everything's okay, but the five prior months were like way worse than than what he had done so that that's like the concern for me yeah i i feel that and and i'm kind of with you there like two months of a hot streak that's a long hot streak that means there's definitely talent that is playing a huge portion in that i mean it takes talent to put up these numbers in the course of a season no matter what like i'm not saying xander bogarts is not a talented player yeah he's very good it's it's definitely a little bit concerning that his best month prior to September, he hit 281 with three home runs. I guess technically March, he actually had a pretty hot month. Six home runs, a 308 average, or a- April, I guess. But then he was just cold and cold and cold. And you do kind of wonder if part of that goes with the way that the team was playing. Because, like, nobody on the team was playing up to their abilities last year. Even Juan Soto, even Manny Machado, who the year prior had been uh, number two, I believe, in the MVP voting. So, like, it was a disappointment of a season team-wide. But coming right off signing a $280 million contract, you're definitely expecting this guy to go out and still be the best player in the team. And he was by no means the best player in the team. You had... Kim Ha Song, you have Fernando Tatis. Like, you had guys who did play well last year. And Bogarts just throughout most of the season was not that guy. So. Yeah. And, and even after saying all that, it was still a four war season. So yeah. let's not completely shortchange Bogarts. Like, he's still good and he's still probably going to be good. Next well, yeah, because he went to Harvard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, but the two shortstops that got significantly smaller deals, uh, Dansby Swanson with your Chicago Cubs, 177 mil over seven years, and Carlos Rodon, that's, I thought that was going to say Correa. I'm sorry. Let me skip down He's a little bit. Down the list. Carlos Correa, yeah. 200 for six years. <laughs> it yeah. threw me off that you had Carlos right after Dansby, and I'm like, yeah, that checks out. Like, oh, no. Nope. Yeah, so I don't really have what we said on uh, Dansby. I didn't listen to that podcast, but you were Dansby, you were really hyped about it. Like you, you thought yeah. you thought last year that that was going to be probably the best signing out of all of the shortstops. And to be honest, after his first season with the Cubs, I kind of have to agree with that. Like, yeah, he, he kind of did exactly what he was signed to do. He played great defense. Um above average as a hitter he posts every day basically and uh, i think yeah he's just kind of got like a high floor maybe that won't last into his 
mid thirties, but we're also talking about a guy that's not signed as long as a Bogarts and a Correa. Like he'll be 35 when his contract ends. Those guys will be like 40, 40 plus when their contracts end. So that's the difference in the contract structure. So, I mean, I was happy with this, this contract last year. I'm still fine with it now. Like, yeah, this is what and, it costs to get guys that will consistently put up like above average seasons. And that's exactly what you're like looking for. Yeah. And AAV wise, he's pretty close to those other two guys. Like he's what? 25.3 mil AAV. Uh, Trey is 27, what, 20. So. Yeah. 27, 28. Xander is about 25. So he's paid basically right there at the same. It's just the length of the contract that differs. He also was the only guy to put up a five war season out of the shortstops that were signed last year. So, I mean, last year he was the best straight up. And a lot of that is defensive value. Like his, he was only 4% better than the average 22 home runs, 244 uh, batting average. Like his, his defense does a huge, huge amount for him as far as value but he was also one of the best hitters on a Cubs team who like the pitching was dominant for the Cubs last year behind Justin Steele and a couple other guys that, but like Bellinger and Dansby were kind of the two that were floating the, the offense for a lot of the season. So did exactly what he came in to do. And I don't think anyone has any complaints about it. So, and then we come to Mr. Carlos Correa who uh, uh, is kind of the oddball. There are a lot of complaints about that one. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we won't even, like, go rehash all the, the stuff that led up to him actually reaching a deal with the Twins, but his season was a disaster. Like, there's no getting around it. Like, it was not good. He had plantar fasciitis. Like, he was playing through that. He wasn't playing very well. Um, it just... I, I mean, I'll give him a little bit of a pass. Like plantar fasciitis is not something easy to play through. Like it's extremely painful. I mean, I um, sit at a desk and whenever I have it, it is miserable. Yeah. And he's trying to play like day after day. He wasn't, he was actually like playing a lot. It wasn't like he was on the IL a whole, whole lot this season. If I remember right. Yeah. He, he played 135 games at a 162. Like dude played a lot. He still yeah, he had played a lot. He still had almost 600 plate appearances in the course of the year. Like he had so, he had rest days and IL days for sure, but he went out there and he had a lot of strengths to his game too. He still walked 10% of the time. He still only struck out about 20% of the time. But his 230 average, his kind of just mediocre 18 home runs not terribly great defense ultimately amounted to just 1.1 war for him, which is the lowest that he has ever had by about 2.3 war. Yeah. Over the course of one season. And this one, I don't think I wrote anything down, but I remember last year saying that Carlos Correa was my preferred uh, shortstop to sign because of his age, because of his like track record of putting up, really good seasons i thought he was like the best bet um but the injury bug got him so we can give him part of a pass for that but at the same time like you can't not talk about carlos correa and and how he seems to get hurt quite a bit like that's that's a part of his profile at this point and as he gets older it's likely to get worse or or stay kind of how it's been so that's that's the issue with him like i i agree with you i think his his core skills are still in, intact. He can bounce back with health. He's he can still be a really elite, awesome player. It's just like the health that's that's standing in the way. Yeah. Now, the the plus side for the Twins is that if it doesn't, if the ship doesn't right, it's five more years. It's like <laughs> that's it, a long time. It, man. It's, it's a long time, but it could have been ten. Because that was kind of what people were expecting he was going to get. And when two different physicals failed, two different teams didn't sign him, ended up coming down to six. Like, yeah, I mean, it it could have been worse if it if the ship doesn't right. 
hopefully yeah. the ship rights. Something you said about the you were talking about is war totals, right? I mean, if you throw out 2020 and then you throw out 2023, there's not a season that he didn't have a three four season. So he, yeah, he's and that's all, always in that above average. So that's why I'm okay, like kind of treating 23 as the anomaly, right? It's yeah, the one that I mean, doesn't fit and the rest he's of the still year. only 29. Like, yeah, youth is still on his side. So it's not like his bat speed's going to disappear entirely at 29 years old. So no. I I think there's still enough there that he can figure it out and put together some pretty good seasons for the Twins. I think it's just going to be kind of like a d- different reasons for it, but like Nolan Arenado's first year with the Cardinals, kind of disappointing for a Nolan Arenado season. This was pretty darn disappointing for a Carlos Correa season. But then Nada was an uh, MVP candidate the next year. So who knows? Maybe Correa can do the same. Now that Otani's not in the uh, American League, could actually be a candidate. Who knows? So, all right. So that is it for the big shortstops. Uh, what do you say we go to some of the big pitchers? Yeah, let's do it. All right. I think the biggest pitcher of the entire offseason was Jacob DeGrom, who signed a five-year, $185 million deal to become the ace of the Tejas Rangers. I'm fairly certain that we both loved and hated the deal for a couple of reasons. Because he was, what, 34? Yeah, 34, 35, yeah. When's the last time he's played a full season? Uh, 2019. Okay. I'm fairly certain that was one of the reasons we didn't like it. Uh Uh-huh. I believe the reason we loved it is because even though he's not had a full season since 2019, the dude is the greatest pitcher on the planet when he is on the field. So he makes up a lot of value in about a half season's worth of starts. So if you have him healthy in the back half of the season into the end of the postseason you're in a pretty good spot so yeah and I, mean, I don't know the specific details but didn't this deal have some incentives tied to a healthy elbow like he there he had a chance to like get a sixth year or something if he hadn't had tommy john surgery or or an elbow injury don't quote me on that i'm i might be mixing them up with someone else but uh I mean, yeah, this one, like, there's really not that much to say. Like, he got injured. He was already an injury risk prior to the signing. And it's kind of like, like, do you judge the deal based on him having an elbow surgery? Like, I I just leave this one as an incomplete. Like, there's no... Okay. To say. A $37 million option in his contract will be affected by his Tommy John surgery. Um, yeah, so if he, if he wouldn't have had Tommy John, basically it would have been six years and a hundred or 200 and $18 million. Okay. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. I mean, to, to go into what, what I noted that we said is that, yeah, he hasn't pitched very many innings, but the Rangers don't really care about the quantity. They're just going for quality. And unfortunately, they got neither quality nor quantity because he barely pitched for them this past year. And uh, He made what, two starts? I think it was a few more than that, but it was less than 10. Mm, it was, uh, it was... It was six starts. Six starts. Okay, he had two wins, though. So I was right in the stat that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Wow, and I didn't actually realize, but he was kind of fantastic in those six starts. Isn't that what we just uh, said? They're not going to get quantity, but they're going to get quality out of what they get. They got 30 innings. I guess I didn't remember. They got 30 innings of, like, striking out every single person on the planet. Uh, Almost 40% of batters that he faced. Walking three and a half for a two sixty seven ERA, uh, one and a yeah. half WAR in six starts. 
So I, I think if he's off the field this much, the contract is probably not worth it. But if he can come back from his Tommy John, be this good or even somewhat this good and actually put out like 20 starts a year for a couple of years, I think the contract's worth it. I don't yeah, think I'm going to have any a, problem saying that. But this one feels like a bigger if, right? Because we're talking about an older guy and we're talking about a double Tommy John guy. So that's the issue. That's true. That is very true. But I absolutely can't wait till he gets back. And that'll probably be what sometime later this summer. See if he's the same guy. See, I mean, baseball is just better when one of the elite talents is, is actually playing. Yeah. I'm guessing it'll be August ish whenever he's back. Cause they said it was going to be most of both the parts of two years. Yeah. So that makes sense. Um, all right. So another pitcher that signed that we didn't really talk a whole lot about because we didn't know him at the time. That's Kodai Senga. Um, five year, $75 million deal with the New York Mets out of the NPB came over after the WBC or did he sign before the WBC? I can't remember. I think he would have had to. Yeah, It would have been before. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but we saw him in the WBC with that nasty ghost ghost fork and just striking out everybody he goes plays for the Mets and he didn't win rookie of the year, but he did come in second place. Like Kodai Singa. I don't think we talked about him at all last off season because we just didn't know anything about him. Yeah. He was actually pretty hyped, but I feel like he may have surpassed that hype. He, he basically finished this season extremely strong he seems like he's going to be, you know, a frontline type starting pitcher for at least a few more years. I mean, Mets got a really, really good deal out of this one. And sometimes that can happen with an international signing who's such an unknown. We're talking about like um, Yamamoto and Imanaga this offseason. I mean, um, Imanaga almost feels like he's kind of in the in the Senga mold, like not to make just the cultural uh comparison there but it, it's like the same idea right it's like a we don't know what this is we don't know how it's going to translate but based on everything that he did in japan we think like yeah he's going to be good and and senga showed that he showed that path it's possible and it can happen and it can it can be even better than we imagine sometimes all right so um in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw three names at you. And I want your instant reactions on how they performed last year. All right. You ready? Yeah. All right. So, shoot. I just had them. Where did they go? Taiwan Walker, Tyler Anderson, Chris Bassett. Okay. So, three pretty different guys. Um, they all kind of were beneficiaries of like the big amounts of spending that teams were doing last year on, on free agent pitchers uh, with Walker. He just did not pan out for the Phillies at all. Like he had, like I think he had 15 wins, but like you said, the stat that doesn't matter, basically everything else went way back from, I think he was on the Mets in 22. Yes. Um, yeah, he was coming off a great season and he, you know, he lost strikeout rate. He started walking more batters. He didn't really stay on the field. I mean, that one's not looking so good at this point. I mean, he was on the field 31 starts, 172 innings. So, okay. So like, I'm wrong on that one. Yeah. But I mean, you're right on literally everything else. Um, Strikeout rate was as low as it's ever been at 18%. His walk rate was massive at about 10%. Like, yeah. Is this scares me. A yeah. Lot. His BABIP was 272. So I don't know. Like, all right. So that's Tawan Walker. Tyler Anderson. Tyler Anderson. We were kind of singing his praises. We liked everything that the Dodgers did, but. I guess we didn't correctly factor the fact that 
He was no going to the Angels? the Dodgers. And he was specifically going to the Angels, who have terrible track record with pitchers. We actually did discuss that last year. Um, yeah. But it was all smoke and mirrors, it feels like. Whatever the Dodgers did did not translate even slightly. And, and um, he basically turned back into a pumpkin. Yeah, so um, I, I, I would actually like to make a public apology on something that I said last year. Um, I said that I liked that signing more than Martin Perez going back to Texas. And um, I'm sorry, Martin Perez, you were the better pitcher. Not by much. Not by much. Not by much, but you were better. So I yeah. apologize to Martin Perez and all of the Rangers fans for that horrific mistake that I've made. I think like that one, there's a lesson to be learned specifically from the Anderson signing. Cause yes, he had a great season, but he was 32 year old who put up a four war season in 2022. The rest of his career, he had never put up more than two, two wins. So that's like sometimes you got to look at the big picture, the, the, the track record and kind of say, what do I believe? Do I believe he somehow transformed into something way more than, than he's always been? And the answer to that question is oftentimes no. Yeah. All right. So I, th- uh, oh yeah, Bassett. Forgot about him. That's it. Yeah, Chris Bassett, yeah. three years, $63 million to the Toronto Blue Jays. Yeah, so Bassett's almost like in the same category as like a Taiwan Walker and a Jameson Tyon from last year, where they're sort of like mid, mid-rotation mid guys. Um, Bassett worked out very well for the Blue Jays, and I can't say that I like super expected that to happen, but he was rock solid. Like, he pitched a ton of innings. He's just reliable. And, um, I mean, I don't know what else to say. Like, good job by the Blue Jays. They, they picked the right guy. The, the reason I brought him up is because he's actually, like, one of the guys that we were actually right about, at least yeah. after year one. So it, it's a nice little pick-me-up. It's like, hey, we were right. Okay, so now I want to talk about two guys, one from my team, one from your team. Um, Wilson Contreras. Five year, eighty-seven and a half million dollars to the Cardinals to replace Yadier Molina. That's a heck of a lot of money for a catcher. It just is. And Wilson Contreras is not appreciated as much as he should be for the way that his season finished. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, I think his his season just like uh, like a Turner and a Bogarts, they started slow, and with Contreras, it was more than just on field stuff. It was like he was getting ripped by the fans, he was getting benched by his uh, front office and management and whatnot. Yep, which it, it, just it turns out start. it turns out that some of that was Jack Flaherty admitted was kind of his fault, like. He just Jack and Wilson just weren't on the same page. They didn't really get along for a while. Like it just it took a while for those relationships to really form with some of those pitchers. And that kind of led to a lot of that. And and there was a lot of mental stuff that went on. But as soon as he was trusted, kind of uh, the pitchers were actually working with him a little bit more. He was just trusted by the front office and the manager to just go out and play. He really started to show up and At the end of the season, his season and Sean Murphy's, who was lauded by a ton of people last year, kind of finished in about the same spot in every single category. Period. Go pick a category. They're really, really, really close. Um, So overall, I'm still worried that that contract in general is maybe a little bit more money than it had to have been. I don't hate it i'm one of the i'm one of the cardinal fans that never hated wilson Contreras. in fact i wanted wilson Contreras. i've wanted him for years i think beyond the the money though like you don't you don't need to care about the money what you need to care about is the years right yeah and he's already like kind of getting up there he's what gonna be 33 this year yes but with that 
if he if we figure out how to clear out a little bit of space, if he DHs a little bit, we've got Ivan Herrera, who is ready. He is ready. Like, that's why they moved on from Kiz, is because they need to start getting him behind the plate. And I think we're at the point where Wilson can become a halftime catcher and a halftime something else. And okay. it'll, as the contract ages, Paul Goldschmidt is only signed through this year. Like, they're potentially going to work on an uh, extension, but they said they're not going to rush it. They're going to see how spring goes, how he's feeling, how they're feeling, and feel it out that way. So a lot can happen by the end of the year with our first base situation, which could affect a lot of things, including yeah, but how Wilson's used. I guess I wasn't expecting to go down this path, but you don't want Wilson to be a DH because that reduces, like, his impact, right? Because his contract is signed to be a catcher and and that's why yeah and, and that's uh, why all the money, and right? that's why i don't think he's going to be a full time dh but as his contract ages and he ages i do think you'll see more herrera and less contreras behind the plate you'll see contreras still on the field hitting but he'll be almost relegated to like a half and half role yeah. as opposed to being the two out of every three day guy so, um, and then one year, $17.5 million bet on himself, signed as the center fielder with the Chicago Cubs, Cody Bellinger. Yeah, so I'm very torn on this one. I feel like I've gone, specifically in this offseason, I've gone like back and forth on what I think about Cody Bellinger. But going back to last year, like, he was left on the scrap heap. Like, any team could have gone out and given him a a good offer, and the Cubs were the ones that were lucky enough to reap the benefits of his great 2023 season. But you can't tell me that a year ago you you would say that Cody Bellinger would get, like, a $200 million contract, right? Like, that seemed pretty much impossible so one year any one year just like we talked about with tyler anderson this is at a different level we're talking about like an elite level player really good player if that changes in one year it's probably a bad idea is is where i'm at with it i think he does a lot of things that kind of raise his floor he's not going to like put up a tyler anderson level season as a position player, but he plays good defense. He runs the bases well. He's very young, but there's like very concerning things in his profile. Like he doesn't hit the ball super hard. He's had these massive fluctuations in his performance. And that's something that is probably giving teams pause right now about signing him to like a 10 year deal or whatever Scott Boris wants him to sign. So, yeah. But for 2022, 2023, it was a great signing by the Cubs. It worked out fantastic. really, really well. How yeah, that so looks going into this year is entirely different. So yes, yes. And that's probably the most extreme case of like how something can change like in one year. Has anyone ever built this much value in a year? It doesn't. I can't think of any off, off the top of my head. So I don't know that he built this much. I think he he kind of had like a he, he recaptured a soft, it. Basically. He recaptured it. Like he had a soft pencil mark, but there was also like a or maybe it's here and it's you didn't know where it was because of the down seasons that he had. But yeah, and they weren't just he, down seasons, right? They like were they were they yeah. were like he was like one of the worst players in Major League Baseball as a regular. Yeah, that's fair. But he showed that he still has the ability to be that guy. And yeah. so it's it's like he recouped and deserved some of it. Or it deserves... I don't know how to phrase that the right way because that sounds like he deserves the money that he gets paid, period. Yeah, that's just kind of how absolutely. it works. Um, but yeah, he's not going to get the contract that he would have got if he would have stayed MVP level. But this definitely goes, oh, the MVP is still there. We just got to figure out how to unlock it. 
So it's like, how much money do you dock from his salary to put in investing to get that value back out of him? So like, uh, where do you invest it? Do you invest it in him and trust him? Or do you invest it in training and coaching to help him achieve that? So ultimately he's going to be worth the same amount of money. It's just, do you give it all to him or do you split it in two? So I, that's kind of how I look at it. All right, so we're pretty well out of time with how we're going to do this for our new format. So I will give you the opportunity to pick out the worst signing. And one quick little note about something that uh, someone that we haven't talked about yet. So who's the worst signing uh, out of all of last year's offseason? Well, based on these multi-year deals, I think the signing was uh andrew benintendi like who took most of the season to hit his first home run yeah it was it was just not a good season he ended up with an even 0.0 fan graphs uh he hit five home runs total and it was just like this is not what you want to allocate five years and 75 million dollars to like you could have done just about anything and it would have been more productive than this signing. Like it just it didn't make sense at the time why they were using their money for that and not addressing their many, many other holes. And uh, it played out kind of like how I thought it would, unfortunately for the White Sox. Yeah. All right. Any other guy you want to talk about or is that it? No, I think I'm, I'm good. All right, cool. So thank you very much. Make sure to check out This Week in Baseball that was actually posted already. Um, we will see you back here later this week for a new This Week in Baseball. We still record live on Twitch. Uh, actually, both of the episodes from one week are recorded back to back in one night. So if you want to see how that works, come hang out with us on Twitch. Otherwise, we will see you back here later on. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app or YouTube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Getaway Day Pod. If you enjoy card collecting, check out our sister YouTube channel at Getaway Day Cards.